Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. Is everybody able to see my screen okay? All right. <clears throat> Well, thank you for joining me, everyone, and thank you very much, Charlie, for the introduction. Um, I am coming to you from Portland, Maine, and uh, from Wild Seed Project. And if you don't know very much about what we do, um, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown. So to start, we um, actually are a, a nonprofit conservation, um, conservation organization for native plants, and we do lots of education and outreach around uh, the significance and value of native plants and um, want to inspire people to take action and plant natives in their own yards. So through that, we actually sell seeds of native plants. That is one thing that makes us very unique. Um, and we um, put out an annual publication. Um, this year, our publication was called um, Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes, a Wild Seed Project Guide. And in previous years, we've put out um, a wild seed magazine, which featured articles and beautiful artwork and photographs by uh, people from all over the ecological um, conservation, horticulture, and a restoration world. Um, and tonight, I want to talk to you about gardening for wildlife. And this is in the autumn, but also year round. I think it's a really timely time to talk about this topic, but um, I hope that it can help you kind of conceptualize a new way to garden, maybe unlearn some of your gardening practices that have been so indoctrinated from um, the ornamental horticulture or vegetable gardening world um, in us and um, look at landscapes in a little, in a slightly different way so that, you know, we're thinking about how to foster more life in our landscapes overall. Um, one of the uh, pieces that we've uh, recently initiated um, at Wild Seed Project is this call, something called the Pledge to Rewild. It's a campaign that is a call to action. It enables people to think about restoring native plants in their own landscapes um, where they live and adopting mindful landscape practices, which uh, tonight we'll be concentrated, concentrating mainly on. And then also joining forces with each other um, in order to connect those fragmented habitats um, that have become so prevalent in our world and to spread this message of, um, of planting native. So you can see that rewilding is not just simply about planting native, but it involves um, a lot of, of a big human element as well. And a lot of the research for this rewilding movement that we're hoping to um, get really moving is um, inspired by research by, from Doug Tellamy. Now, if any of you have read the Nature, Nature's Best Hope or Doug Tellamy's most recent book, um, The Nature of Oaks, um, then you might understand some of the concepts that I'll talk about uh, with you today. But if you haven't, I strongly encourage you read um, that. He also has a really wonderful book that he wrote before Nature's Best Hope called Bringing Nature Home. And a lot of his work revolves around looking at the insect and plant interactions that are so important and, and make native plants um, really the basis of our food webs, our local food webs. Um, so he's done especially a lot of research on moth and butterfly caterpillars, which feed on many of our native trees, herbaceous plants, ground covers, um, and shrubs. And then um, they're caterpillars, which are really important for the diet of songbirds in spring, um, especially as they feed their young. Um, they really feed their young on a, a diet mostly of, of insects, and a lot of those are, are caterpillars that soft bodies can fit into the mouths of young birds. Um, so Doug Tellamy advises everyone in, in Nature's Best Hope that if we all can shrink our lawns, even just in half, we don't have to necessarily get rid of them. Um, we can foster a lot more wildlife habitat and this could become a really big environmental movement. Um, now, uh, shrinking your lawn, I think is important because lawns are actually, right now they're the second most irrigated crop in the United States. Um, and that's all just to make them lush and green. 
Uh, we also pour huge amounts of fertilizers and pesticides into them, which become uh, pollutants, especially in our water bodies. We've seen toxic algal blooms recently um, in some of the Great Lakes and oceans and some of our, our major lakes. Um, and you know, they are basically devoid of life for the most part, especially those real traditional lawns where they're just Kentucky bluegrass, no weeds in sight. Um, and they're basically sterile landscapes um, where they don't really host very much life. They're, you know, there's something that we can do better. I think lawns are um, great for, um, you know, they do serve a purpose. They're great for, you know, serving as outdoor rooms, places for recreation, and maybe as pathways that convey us through the landscape, but they don't need to be our default landscape. So we can start by thinking about shrinking our lawns to be just those intentional outdoor rooms and places to play soccer on potentially um, in our backyards and front yards. And then maybe even just start by stopping mowing um, that the parts of the lawn that are not needed and using that unmowed edge as a nice frame for those outdoor rooms and pathways. Otherwise, if you don't have lawn or if you have a small lawn and a very small property, um, you can still stack, pack and layer native plantings into your um, landscape. But even in this small space here, it's a really nice demonstration of how to do that with containerized plants, um, trees and shrubs and planters that wouldn't normally fit into the small garden beds here or vines. Um, of also asters and goldenrods and comb flowers. Um, in this scene, it's a fall scene. It could be right now at this time of year or even a couple weeks ago. Um, and there's so much in bloom, so much packed into this small space, a lot of biodiversity. And I think it's a nice way to kind of think about planting is not just necessarily having the ground cover and then maybe some other ornamental plant, you know, perennials um, that stick out of the ground cover, but having all the different layers um, from that, the ground cover to the knee high perennials to the taller, more kind of structural perennials, the shrubs, the vines, the understory flowering trees, um, the mid height trees, and even the canopy trees if you have space. So planting native trees is actually the first action step in our pledge to rewild and uh, shrinking your lawn is the second action step. Those are, I think, some of the most important things you can do to rewild your landscape. Um, if you plant, especially these species of native trees, the oaks, willows, cherries, birches, and poplars, you could also plant um, native shrubs of these genera. Um, then you will host more life than any other native plant could host on its own. Um, these are what Doug Tallamy calls keystone plants, um, plants that host huge amounts of moth and butterfly caterpillar species on them. So the oaks, for instance, are up to 500 plus, I think, depending on where you live. I think in Maine, it might be closer to around 400 plus species of moth and butter moths and butterflies that they host. Um, and I love this example of the black cherry. So I did get a chance to work um, at Garden in the Woods and raise silk moths there. I worked there for about six years and I actually was an intern in 2010 before I even started working there um, full time as a horticulturist. And um, during my time as an intern is actually when I got introduced to raising um, silk moths and some butter native butterflies also. So I got a chance to be kind of up close and personal with their life cycles and learn more about why they're important. Um, the Cecropia silk moth is, is a gorgeous, huge moth that you probably have not seen um, if you're not somebody who's outdoors a lot or just have not had a chance to raise silk moths because they spend just such a few days of um, their lives as adults, their winged adults. Um, and that when they're winged adults, they're really only um, there to uh, reproduce and lay eggs and then that's it. So um, the female lays its eggs on a toast plant and it's usually a native tree like a cherry or a sassafras or a tulip poplar um, or something like that. Many other native moths have other host plants. 
like the luna moth, um, especially uh, requires plants in the walnut family. Um, but the, it'll lay its eggs on the undersides of the leaves and then they'll eat the leaves all season and become these really interesting looking caterpillars. Um, even as cat in their caterpillar stage, they're really, really cool looking. Uh, I love how this one, you know, as it gets bigger, it looks very chunky and it has these spikes with um, little red balls and blue and yellow balls kind of coming off of the spikes. Um, then the caterpillars pupate around August when they've eaten enough and gained enough energy and they spend all winter in their cocoons. Uh, they pupate and they hang on the branches of the cherry trees. Cherry is their preferred host. Um, and, you know, some silk moths actually uh, fall down to the leaf litter and, and uh, pupate like the luna moth um, does. And they'll, so they're a lot more vulnerable in the leaf litter, but the cecropia moth does hang from the branches, which makes it a little less vulnerable. Then they close or hatch from their cocoons in the month of May or early June, and this cycle starts over again. So um, I wanted to just let you know too that, you know, that publication that we put out every year, it's the, the one that we put out this year is a tree guide. Um, it's called Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes and it covers about 31 species of trees, large, medium and small trees. Um, and isn't, it's not as necessarily an identification guide, though it does give some ID features. It's more to show you how you can incorporate a native tree into your landscape and what to expect from it and what kind of wildlife value it has. So I also really like that we've added in some plant lists. Um, one of the plant lists is for native street trees. So if you don't have enough room for a, a black cherry tree, you can put in a beach plum, for instance, which the cherries and the plums kind of go together. Those are both keystone genre. They're both um, prunus. And um, a beach plum will also host um, 400 plus species of moths and butterflies and bear fruit, which is further great for um, wildlife. Same with the black cherry. And the flowers are really important um, for early season pollinators too. So other keystone genre to kind of to consider adding into your landscapes after you shrink your lawn are things like asters and goldenrods and other things in the aster family too like cone flowers those are all considered to be keystone genre they support um, several hundred species of moth and butterflies and they also are really um, critical late season forage of nectar and pollen for bees and wasps so I think there's an aster and a goldenrod for every garden, at least one. And then I think every garden should have an aster and a goldenrod. And what I mean by that is that there's so many species of asters and goldenrods. Many are very garden worthy. I like to say garden worthy because, you know, I think there are some goldenrods that give the rest of the genre a bad reputation like the Canada goldenrod, which um, can get a little bit more aggressive. It's thought of more as a weed, um, but goldenrods um, are also blamed for seasonal allergies and they actually don't cause seasonal allergies. There are other plants in bloom at the same time that are responsible for those seasonal allergies like ragweed and grasses, which are wind pollinated, whereas goldenrods are animal pollinated and that pollen is actually sticky and heavy and sticks to the bodies of bees, legs and bodies. Um, so they're less likely to cause allergies. So I just wanna get that out there that, you know, I, I'm gonna push goldenrods as much as possible because they're one of my favorite groups of plants. Um, and there's, you know, great goldenrods for shade. There's the zigzag goldenrod and that loves moist shade. Whereas the, um, the wreath or the blue stem goldenrod you might know it as um, does well in drier shade or even a little bit of sun. And it's called wreath goldenrod because it has its flowers come out of like the axles of um, the stem and the leaf. And so the flowers look like they're lining the stem, um, makes it really beautiful, has a really nice habit. Um, there's also lots of petite, lovely goldenrods for sun as well, which are not pictured here, but um, the gray goldenrod and the downy goldenrod. And actually at Wild Seed Project, we sell seeds of 
these two goldenrods pictured here as well as um, the downy goldenrod. And the, the downy goldenrod doesn't get more than um, a couple feet tall, maybe three feet at the very most, but it's very delicate. It's not too aggressive. It doesn't seed around too much. Um, and it's a very garden worthy one. The flax leaf stiffaster is one that can grow in full sun, baking hot soil, and it can grow pretty much straight out of sand. Um, it's a coastal plain plant. Um, and it doesn't get very tall, maybe a foot tall at the most, and it's nice and upright, uh, really, you know, beautiful upright foliage and flowers and uh, very floriferous. And then it actually has really lovely fall color. Um, the blue uh, wood aster, um, as well as the white wood aster are a really nice pairing together. And the blue wood aster and white wood aster uh, do really well in shade or part sun and can handle dry soils as well. I, I will actually often put together blue wood aster, white wood aster, and the wreath goldenrod and plant them on a dry shady slope at the top. And then they'll seed down the slope and kind of populate the slope. So I'm not having to do all the work of planting the entire slope. We did that at Garden in the Woods and I think very successfully. And I love how the blue wood aster um, blooms a little bit later into the season than the white wood aster. The white wood aster starts a little bit earlier. Um, so their bloom times are kind of staggered. And right now actually in Portland, blue wood aster is still in bloom in October. So with all of that said about the plants that we need to be putting into our landscape, it's important that we're sourcing quality plants and not just necessarily getting plants from Home Depot or the big box nurseries. Um, if possible, it would be best if we were all able to support some of the smaller nurseries that are trying to have best growing practices. And some of those growing practices that I would favor would be um, if they're not using pesticides in their practices, they're those neonicotinoids <clears throat> are really detrimental to pollinators and they can stay in the plant for a couple years um, or more. So after you bring that plant home, it'll still be, you know, if, if it's a host plant for uh, a pollinator, then that pollinator will be taking in the pesticide through its leaves. So that's something to consider. And then another one is that it's great to buy seed grown plants if possible. Now in Massachusetts, you have a really, um, a number of great nurseries um, and sources for uh, seed grown native plants, especially native plant trusts. And they have a location in Waitley, Massachusetts, as well as Garden in the Woods in Framingham. So you have both sides of the states covered. Um, and I think it's important to grow plants from seed if possible because um, most nurseries these days have plants that are um, cloned and, you know, they could be cloned through tissue culture, uh, they could be um, grown from cuttings or some other method of asexual reproduction, which has become a way to kind of streamline things and make um, growing plants more efficient. But unfortunately, it has some negative consequences, um, such as they're kind of bottlenecking a lot of the genes. Um, and the gene pool in these in specific species of plants that they grow because uh, when you clone a plant, you're getting a genetic replica of the last plant that you got it from. So there's no variability in its genetics and no, um, not necessarily any um, adaptive, you know, that can make the plant less adaptable, future generations of that plant less adaptable to things like climate change stressors, um, flooding and drought and heat. And uh, while it might make the plant, you know, sometimes um, cultivation in that way, you know, with a cultivar, you have to um, actually um, clone the plant to maintain its traits. And when you're, when you're, um, doing that, you're maybe quote unquote improving the plant by making it maybe visit, uh, resistant to a certain disease or pest, but there could be another one that it's not resistant to, or um, it could be improved for um, flowering time, color of the fruit, size of the fruit or flower, things like that. But we don't know what consequences that has for 
um, the pollinators and the ecological value of the plant. So there's a lot to consider when buying your native plants, even if you are really excited about buying native plants. Um, we actually have a really lovely uh, blog post on our website called Navigating the Nurseries that explains, explains a lot of these issues in depth. And then um, that blog post links to where to buy native plants, a page that goes more in depth than, than this slide here. But here's just a few examples of where um, of good places to buy native plants. Um, but um, it's important that you know we think about these things as we start to create more of a demand for native plants. And that's a big reason why um, Wild Seed Project was started in Maine, because Maine has traditionally had a, or historically had a lot less resources for people interested in learning about native plants and buying them. And now there's there's definitely more um, interest in them at this time. And so um, the supply is not keeping up with the demand of native plants here. And so we're looking to help some of those smaller nurseries get off the ground that are, that are wanting to grow native plants and, and do it right. So what you plant is just as important as how you manage your plantings um, and what you do in the landscape year round. Um, and I think a really good case in point is the checker spot life cycle. Um, the Baltimore checker spot butterfly is a really beautiful butterfly. It, Massachusetts, I think, is kind of near the northern tip of its range, but in most of its range, it's actually declining. And um, that's because of loss of habitat. And that habitat is its host plants. Uh, one of its major host plants is the white turtle head. It actually lays its eggs on the white turtle head in spring. And then those uh, larvae hatch and will actually munch away at the plant as a big group. They'll form this protective webbing around them and they'll use that webbing actually to form a little um, bridge from one eaten up branch to the next new branch with fresh leaves. And I've watched this happen at Garden in the Woods. We um, had the help um, of somebody who raises butterflies and moths. Um, he gave us eggs to start getting a population going at Garden in the Woods. And they really went, did very well at Garden in the Woods. Uh, we actually had to spread them around to more um, turtle head plants because they, the area that they started in, there were too many caterpillars for the amount of turtle head plants that there were. But then, you know, thinking about their life cycle more, um, it doesn't stop there. Um, at the end of that first growing season, they crawl down to the leaf litter and overwinter as caterpillars. So the, they're extremely vulnerable at that stage. And they, if the leaf litter gets moved away, they will not um, make it to adulthood. So if they do make it, then the next spring they climb up the plants again and, and keep eating. And then by mid, um, spring, mid to late spring, they'll pupate into these gorgeous chrysalises and then um, the cycle starts over again. So you can see how that life cycle um, really implies what we need to be doing in our landscapes. If we can, we need to leave the leaves. And that means leaving them intact um, when they fall and through the winter as long as possible and uh, not blowing or raking them or shredding them. Um, because leaves are basically nature's mulch. They sustain birds. Um, the, you know, the, all the life that's in the leaf litter is something that's eventually going to sustain birds and also standing vegetation will. Um, they protect overwintering pollinators, not just moth and butterfly cocoons and caterpillars, but also things like some species of bumblebees will nest under the leaf litter many frogs and salamanders and um, other creatures take life, you know, create um, shelter in the leaf litter or overwinter in it or spend some part of their life cycles there. Never mind all the micro and macro organisms that are um, becoming part of the soil web as the leaves break down and be, build living mulch for the soil. Um, they also insulate plant roots. Um, so, you know, in times of climate change, when we're having more mild winters and not as much snow cover, um, our ground is not getting insulated by that blanket of snow. And so I think if we keep our leaves down, that's going to serve as an insulating blanket for plant roots. 
Um, and eventually that breaks down and becomes really nice, rich um, humusy soil, which is one of what we want to see. It's what happens in a forest. And I think as much as we can in our gardens, if we can replicate what happens in a forest, then I think we're going to, going to, going to be better off and support more life. So I actually wrote a blog post about this last year. And if you want to learn even more about it or revisit some of the things we talk about tonight, then feel free to go and check that out. But overall, you know, leave, whether you leave the leaves or anything else that you do during the season, you want to think about um, all the different things that you have to balance. And I know that we're all thinking about wildlife value here. That's one of the big reasons we're all here tonight. But we also are thinking about the aesthetics of it. Do we have to trade off um, wildlife value for aesthetics? Oops. Um, there we go. <laughs> and then what about our workload management? If we leave the leaves in the fall, do we have tons of work to do in spring? Um, so there's a lot to juggle and it can be a learning process, I think, for a good portion of, um, you know, maybe for a year or two as you take time to observe what happen, happens in your landscape naturally and what you want to do to kind of manage it versus just kind of going out, seeing one leaf fall on the ground and taking out your leaf blower and getting rid of it right away. Um, I think we all need to rethink what our yard cleanup means. And so, you know, leaves are also a precious resource that they build living soil, they become nature's mulch. And um, if we take them away, whether it be blowing them into the woods or bagging them up and getting them taken to a composting facility, um, yes, maybe those things are not the worst thing that could happen to the, those leaves. They're not going in the trash necessarily, but um, at the same time, we're taking them away. And this is, you know, something that we could be, instead of buying um, bark mulch in or some sort of outside input to amend our soils to fit the plant's needs, we could be leaving our leaves and having them feed our plants. Um, so never mind mowing and blowing can be really disruptive um, to um, the life cycle of those butterflies and moths. So if you think about that caterpillar of the Baltimore checker spot that's so vulnerable in the leaf litter, a leaf blower coming and blowing that away or even a rake um, can be detrimental to that the population of Baltimore checker spots in your area. And I think especially in urban and suburban areas, we've seen a decline of especially those moths and butterflies and other creatures that spend a good portion of their life cycles in uh, the leaf litter. So I really like looking at um, even this kind of situation and thinking about leaving the leaves as mulch. So especially under trees, we need to think about leaving those leaves because like the luna moth does, it drops down from the trees in the fall and spends a lot of its, um, the whole winter um, in the leaf litter as a in its cocoon. You know, there's, there's definitely different things you need to think about when uh, leaving your leaves. You know, do you leave all of them? Do you, um, what do you do with the excess leaves? And um, if you've, I think if you've, um, if you've reduced your lawn and then you have more places for the leaves to go, but if you have a lot of blacktop, which actually I do in Portland, um, or you have um, a huge, a significant amount of lawn, then even you know all the leaves that come over from the neighbor neighbors' houses, or if you have mature trees on your property, you're not going to have a place to put those leaves. But it would actually be better for the trees that are on your property to keep those leaves in place if possible. So I think shrinking your lawn is a good place to start and looking for other ways to kind of consolidate the extra leaves that you have that you don't have a place for. Because it's true, you can't pile up um, six inches of leaves on top of your lawn or it will, will smother it. Even on a garden bed, if you have you know, a foot of leaves, that might be a bit too much. So you need to think of how to consolidate them. Um, composting them is a really nice, you know, thing to do because aged leaves, they start to go, you know, um, go through that decomposition process and you'll start getting organisms that are part of that process in your leaves and you'll start building really good organic matter 
and compost to spread on your garden beds. Um, you can do that in either just a pile, like a next to your compost pile and you're in a leaf pile, or you can um, get more creative and put leaves into a fence. So this is at Garden in the Woods a long time ago, way before I started working there. This is Tom Smarr, who is the past director of Garden in the Woods with volunteer volunteers. And they, they were doing this kind of fun experiment where they were, um, I think had to block off a portion of the garden for some reason or another. And so they coiled up chicken wire. Um, you could do it with hardware cloth or chicken wire, whatever wire fence and make columns with it and then stuff the leaves into the columns. And then I actually find when you do that, the leaves break down really, really fast and um, almost so fast that you don't have enough leaves to keep them full, which um, is a good problem to have. So um, you can keep stuffing them with leaves throughout the season and each fall. And you can see it in this living, in this leaf fence, um, this, the stuff at the very bottom um, of this leaf column fence is, is pretty much broken down. It's pretty much compost or soil. And the one on the left actually has plants growing out of it. So we didn't plant those plants at Garden in the Woods. This is in the family activity area there. Um, this was These plants just volunteered there because there were seeds of them in the area. There were other plants around. So this is the wood poppy, one of my favorite native uh, woodland wildflowers in the spring. Uh, has really gorgeous um, yellow blossoms and then is followed by um, these dangling seed heads that are quite fuzzy and ornamental in their own right. Um, we have asters and other species that have seeded into these little leaf column fences. Um, and then there's other, you know, materials stuffed into this fence as experiment. Um, and I think it's kind of a fun thing to do. It actually became a fiddlehead maze for kids to uh, walk around in. And the little, little kids couldn't see their way out. So they'd run around and run around and <laughs> yell over to their parents on the other side of the fence. Um, but I think of it as kind of a leaf to living fence. Another option for kind of consolidating your leaves is to... Um, shred them. And I, I don't really think that this is the best, best method either, but it, there is kind of a middle ground. And if you still feel like you have too many leaves and you know what to do with, and um, you like how it looks, aesthetically shredded leaves do look a little bit more dressed up. If you put them down as mulch in your garden beds than whole leaves, and um, they don't blow around as much either. But shredding your leaves, no matter what time of year, you're still running the risk of shredding up those overwintering creatures um, in the leaves. So that is one thing to consider. Um, at Garden in the Woods, there were many years in which we actually practiced shredding. We shredded a lot of the leaves in the garden. We'd blow off the leaves from the more, um, you know, Garden in the Woods is a naturalistic garden, but the more managed garden beds, we'd blow the leaves off and into the garden paths. And then we'd come behind with a, a toe behind um, leaf shredder that had a vacuum on it. And we'd suck them up with a rake and a vacuum, spend a lot of time. That was a gas powered machine. Uh, the blowers were gas powered, spend like about a month on either end of the growing season in the fall and in the spring, shredding those leaves. And then we'd put you know a layer of them back on the garden beds to go to put to bed for winter and then spread more leaf mulch um, back on in spring before the emergence came up. And that was a lot of work. And I think um, over time we ended up changing that practice so that we would, um, we adjusted it to do, to do less leaf shredding, less disturbance to the leaves and to use gas a little bit less in our garden. And it was a lot of noise pollution, it was smelly, it used a lot of fossil fuels. So we decided to kind of a middle ground would be to leave the leaves whole in the interior of the garden beds and then shred the edge of the garden bed, like rake the leaves off of the edge and then put down a new fresh layer of fluffy shredded mulch so that you could see that there was a nice edge to the bed and it looked a little bit more dressed up there, but the interior was more whole leaves like a forest. And people didn't know the difference. Uh, visitors um, 
didn't realize that we weren't shredding the same amount of leaves as before. They thought that we were shredding all of our leaves. And the spring emergence of the new native plants came up just fine through those whole leaves. So, you know, another kind of approach to consider is not necessarily removing all, you know, removing the leaves from a whole garden bed or, or putting them back on or figuring out what to do with the extra leaves, but to let the leaves blow around um, in the fall and settle in where they're going to over the winter. And then, um, and then actually, you know, remove them from the interior of shrubs where they can get stuck or the edge of a fence or in the crack of a rock or certain areas where they might pile up. Um, and also to think about even observing where the leaves blow throughout the growing season. I mean, sorry, throughout the fall and winter, and then even moving your plantings accordingly or redesigning your garden to not, not just for aesthetic appeal, but for functionality. So uh, I learned this from Uli Lorimer, who is the director of horticulture at Garden in the Woods right now. I got to work with him for uh, about a year and a half before I left Garden in the Woods. And he worked at um, Brooklyn Botanic Garden for over 14 years. And he worked by himself a lot. He sometimes had another intern or volunteer working with him. But in his um, the area where he worked in the native plant garden there, um, he was very understaffed. So he had to kind of think of ways to do less work in the garden or to kind of make everything work with just one person. Um, and at Garden in the Woods, we were very understaffed. We just had, I think at the most, we had um, three or four staff full-time and then sometimes two interns during the growing season to manage a 45-acre garden. So we couldn't possibly... Um, deal with all the leaves that we had. Um, so he had, so Uli Lormer introduced this idea to me that, you know, maybe you redesign your garden beds just a little bit or tweak where some plantings are. And this might be like looking at the landform uh, where the leaves blow. So in the more concave kind of valleys, the lower portions of the landscape, you can, you know, you get more leaves settling in. And so in the dell of our woodland garden, we would have that belly of the woodland garden, we'd have tons of leaves and we did have to kind of figure out what to do with the excess or those delicate ephemerals and, um, and ground covers wouldn't be able to come up through them. So we would shred those um, or we'd also plant um, much um, kind of stronger stemmed perennials in there, like coneflowers and um, black cohosh and blue cohosh. Um, those things get, that can really pierce up through that thicker leaf litter. And then in the more convex portions of the landscape, like this rock garden here, where um, things could easily, you know, things, it wouldn't really hold leaves on it. The leaves would always slough off um, that kind of more con convex portion of the landscape. We would plant um, things like ground covers and really delicate, weaker stemmed plants that, um, that wouldn't be able to handle a thick layer of leaves on them because the leaves won't stay there. So it's just a nice thing to think about so you can take into account some of these different approaches to manage your leaves without um, mowing and blowing all of them away. And then the spring emergence, here's a few examples of many of our, actually our woodland wildflowers. Some of them are delicate ephemerals um, like the spring beauty up on the upper left or the trout lily on the upper right or the blue uh, Virginia bluebells on the lower left that are very delicate looking plants, but we're able to pierce up through whole leaves, even like a good four to six inches of whole leaves. Um, and same with um, the lower bottom, that, that's the um, spring meadow rue and, or early meadow rue, and then the lower right is um, the blue cohosh. So these look very delicate, but can handle thick whole leaves. Now what to do with um, those fallen logs and sticks that can look a little bit messy in the landscape. If possible, please leave them. And that's because you'll get great fungi growing out of them, like the edible chicken of the woods, or you'll get a really mossy log, if it, especially if it falls into 
um, a body of water, um, it's going to stay moist and that moistness will actually um, be a perfect environment for moss to grow on. And if you don't know what to do still, um, just get creative and think about ways that you can rearrange the sticks um, on your property that fall. If you have a woodlot, for instance, I really love this Hidden Valley sculpture at Garden in the Woods. Um, Gary Smith actually created it initially a number of years ago. He's a landscape architect who's done work um, designing children's gardens and many other types of gardens with public gardens. Um, and he works closely with the staff, to, the horticulture staff to make sure that he's using um, regional plants um, that are appropriate for those gardens. So um, he's a really wonderful landscape architect and he's also an artist and um, just kind of sketched this idea in an afternoon and then worked on it with volunteers and they put it together. They dragged the fallen logs um, in this general area into this lovely sinuous snaky design. And um, I think it really emphasizes the topography here very nicely. Um, it's He mostly used the non kind of um, leafy or branchy um, fallen logs, the ones that have lost all those extra branches so that it looks kind of more clean. Um, and I think I've seen actually lots of Garden in the Woods volunteers homes and they've created kind of a mini hidden valley in their own backyard. Um, or you can take smaller sticks that fall and cut them up and, and stack them in different waves. I saw um, a Wild Seed Project member's home where I took this picture who, who did that. You can create lots of more um, um, opportunities for life like millipedes and other decomposers. Um, salamanders live under fallen logs and many frogs. And so you know, by cleaning up and rearranging, but without cleaning out too much, because that woody debris that falls is really important for a whole nother suite of life, those decomposers. Um, and I love the wattle fence as well. That's one of my favorite types of things to do with prunings, especially. So I like to prune my shrubs in the winter. And um, if I've pruned one particular type of plant, like a willow or um, even a, a, even a spice bush or something like that with long slender stems and they're all kind of a similar size, I will create kind of a wattle fence out of it. Um, it's a really lovely thing to do. It does take a lot of prunings to do that with, but um, I think you could do, you know, a smaller version of this too. It doesn't have to look so robust as this. Um, so, uh, you know, moving on to a slightly different topic, but it's still related is, thinking about, um, you know, if you're going to not mow um, your um, property as much or keep certain areas unmowed and still keep some areas of lawn, um, you can transform it into layers um, like this kind of backyard meadow and have the um, late season uh, flowers, uh, the late August and early September flowers of the New York ironweed and Joe pie weeds, sneeze weeds, and um, the woodland sunflowers in the background here as well. And then in the winter, if you can leave anything up that's been standing um, as standing vegetation, you can cut back other things that are, you know, not structural, that are not holding their shape, that are looking floppy or just not looking right to you. You don't have to leave everything up, but especially think things like cone flowers, um, grasses that have that keep their shape, anything that's structural and, and nice and sturdy um, is a nice thing to keep up because the birds that don't migrate south in the winter really require um, berries and um, seed heads of things like cone flowers um, and places to hide and, and forage and um, find cover from predators as well through the winter. But, you know, something to consider is, um, you know, if you don't want something to seed around and become a little bit more aggressive in your landscape, you might want to cut it back. So there's things that you might leave up for wildlife specifically, but you might cut back 
other things you might cut back so that it doesn't seed in. Things like northern sea oats, it's a really beautiful seed head, but it can seed around the garden. So at Garden in the Woods, we would wait for the northern sea oats, the, the seeds to come out. They have this flattened seed head, which is really beautiful. But um, right as they, right after they started to turn tan, that means that, or kind of a bronzy color, that means it's starting to become ripe and the seed will be viable. So we'd cut it back before the seed became viable. Um, but this is a lovely seed head and you can let the plant um, live out its full ornamental life by letting it become kind of a bronzy tan and letting those flattened seed heads wave in the wind. Um, I also, you might not know this grass in the middle here, that's actually a really lovely native grass called bushy blue stem. It's become, I think, one of my absolute favorite grasses because it turns this really nice salmon pink in the, in the winter. This is a winter picture. Um, there's also some little blue stem in the background, so you might see that as well. And it has these really fluffy, poofy seed heads, um, and it stays nice and upright. It's not quite as tall as big blue stem, which gets about seven to eight feet tall, and it's not quite as short as little blue stem, which is more two to three feet. This is more like three and a half feet or so tall, and um, it's nice and upright, lovely winter. And I don't mind this one seeding around because it's not overly aggressive and um, I like having a big swath of this in my landscape because of how beautiful it is. Common milkweed, if you if it's in a small garden, you might not want it to seed around because common milkweed is kind of one of our, one of our more aggressive milkweeds. We have plenty of more garden worthy milkweeds like the butterfly milkweed and um, swamp milkweed poke milkweed. Those are some really great ones to plant in smaller gardens, but the common milkweed is also, it also spreads by rhizome. So if you have one little plant of it, sooner or later, that, that there's going to be several little sprouts that come up around that plant and it could become a bit of a monoculture. In a big field, that's fine to have a lot of milkweed and it's good because we need milkweed for our monarch butterflies. Um, it's a host plant for them, but I can understand in a small garden, you might want to cut it back. Same with maybe a goldenrod that you don't want to seed around. Um, so there's lots to consider. Um, you can also think about adding plants with pithy stems into your plant palette. So that might be something like elderberry, raspberry, joe pie weed. Those um, pithy or hollow stemmed plants provide chambers that are perfect for um, native bees as they lay their eggs in there in spring. And also the adults actually um, go into those chambers again in the fall and over winter um, to hibernate in those chambers. So any, any um, open chambers that you have in your landscape, please protect. And you can cut them back, but I think finding the right time of year to cut them back is essential. So. I really love this illustration by Heather Holm. It's on her website, pollinatorsnativeplants.com. And she's a, a really great resource for learning more about pollinators and what they require. But um, what you can do is in the spring, cut back your things like cone flowers and even elderberry, which is kind of a more shrubby plant. You can cut it back, but maybe keep it up to keep the cut back about 18 inches, or you can have some stems that are different heights. So like she recommends eight to 24 inches in height, and that will allow plenty of space for native bees. And it's actually nice to give them kind of the access by cutting that stem back um, and exposing that chamber. They'll lay their um, eggs in there and the larvae will feed on these little pollen balls. They'll lay up to kind of 30 rows of eggs and pollen balls in, in those. Um, then they'll you know, spend the whole growing season in those chambers and the uh, vegetation will grow up around those stems. So you won't even really be able to see the stems after a while if that's something that you're concerned about. Um, the vegetation itself will hide those dead stems that are up. Then in the winter, please don't cut anything back or fall because um, there's more native, you know, hibernation happening. The adults are hibernating in those stems. Even um, if the um, larvae and, and young native bees have come out during the growing season, 
then start the cycle over in spring. So this, I think this illustration explains it really well, um, how to think about cutting back to foster native bee habitat. Many of our native bees are not colonizers like um, the like some species of bumblebees and are the European honeybees, and they're what are considered as solitary bees. So they lay their eggs in stems or even in the ground. And um, other nesting opportunities for bees as well as wasps are um, in sandy soils. And a lot of these bees and wasps, they actually are not interested in stinging people. A lot of them are very benign. I think the ones that you want to watch out for are those yellow jackets. Those are ground nesters and you don't want to be stepping on their nests for sure or around their nests. You don't want to make them angry. But something like this great black wasp is a really gorgeous wasp. It's um, kind of an iridescent blue color and I always see it uh, feeding on nectar from the spotted bee balm, which is a really cool funky um, Dr. Seuss-like native plant, um, as, along with a suite of other pollinators that love it. The spotted bee balm actually grows in sandy soil, so it kind of works perfectly that that wasp really loves spotted bee balm and its habitat happens to be right around spotted bee balm. Um, also painted turtles and other turtles lay their eggs in often sandy soil because it's easy to dig and well drained. So um, that's another thing to consider. So if you do have sandy soil yourself, um, make sure there's some open spots so that there's nesting habitat and egg laying habitat. So overall, I think we can work in our landscapes to add opportunities and decrease harm. And here's a few other kind of things that, that um, have actually been suggested by Doug Tallamy in his book, um, Nature's Best Hope. Um, adding bee nesting sites is really essential. So what I just talked about, thinking about adding those into your garden, like adding those um, pithy or hollow stemmed plants, or if you happen to have um, sandy soil, making sure that there's some open soil for nesting habitat. I actually don't necessarily think it's a good idea to always have those bee hotels. Um, I think they're, they've become really popular lately. And the idea behind them is they're adding a lot of those kind of chambers for some of our native solitary bees to lay their eggs in ov over the spring or to hibernate in over the winter. But um, what can happen with those is if you're not very, very vigilant about cleaning the materials out each year, then um, they can actually be detrimental to the bee and cause diseases. So you want to make sure with any kind of habitat box that is artificial that you put out, that's not just already part of nature, um, that you're cleaning things out regularly. Because nature naturally cleans itself out, but these boxes, they can also become um, habitat for mice, which is not necessarily the um, targeted wildlife I can understand. Um, adding things like water bubblers and bird baths, especially to have around during migration season and in spring and fall for birds migrating north or south um, is really important. Anything with a sound, if, if you have a waterfall, that's great. If you have a bubbler, even just a regular bird bath, it's going to attract birds. And if you have the native plants, um, burying plants through the winter, as well as um, native plants that host a lot of insects on them, then you'll have even more for the birds to find in your backyard when they come visit. Um, motion sensor lights are really important for um, moths because they travel at night and they're, they're usually looking for their mates when they're traveling at night. Um, they get attracted by light, as we know, and then um, get derailed from their um, travels um, and can, you know, die uh, along the way without getting a chance to reproduce uh, as they're attracted to the light. Window well covers are a small thing that you can easily do. Add them onto your basement windows because that will keep small critters like frogs and salamanders and other um, small creatures from crawling into the window wells and, and getting trapped in there. Um, and then lastly, I think deer fencing, it's, it's kind of on the, it's not really exactly um, along this topic, but I think if you can, when you plant a new tree or shrub, um, 
putting a little fencing around it um, with hardware cloth is a good idea to protect it from the deer. If you have the ability to fence off an area of a garden or your yard um, with a, at least an eight foot tall fence, that will keep the deer from eating the herbaceous layer in your garden, as well as the young seedlings that are coming up of the trees and the potential future canopy trees, which they do in the forests, and it's a real problem. We have an overpopulation of deer. And so if we can have some areas where we can preserve um, the plant diversity um, in some forests or some of our yards, then we can pr and protect them from deer, then we'll have more biodiversity over time. So thank you so much. Um, I want to just give a, a little, you know, this is one of my last slides. So if you have um, questions or comments, feel free to fill out the question and answer box and we'll have a full, you know, at least half hour to go over your questions. But um, on our website, we also have native habitat signs. So we have the leave the leaves sign and you can put that out to let people know that you are doing something. You're not just neglecting your property by leaving the leaves there. There's a cue to care there. Um, and it gives people a good reason why. Also this native habitat for pollinators and birds sign, the do not mow. I really like putting that up in a new meadow or a, an area that would be lawn normally um, in most yards, but is some, you know, something else. Um, and it gives people an indication that there's a reason why I haven't mowed yet. Um, as oftentimes our not neighbors think they're, they're doing something really nice for us when they come and mow our yards, but um, it can be something a, a bit of a problem. This is also really nice because as passers by walk by and see the signs, they see also that you're doing something a little different and it can spark conversation in a very non-confrontational way. It's better than kind of approaching your neighbor and asking them to not spray pesticides and fertilizers or not to mow, but instead it kind of allows them to come to you if they're interested. So thank you everyone. If you have a chance, please take our pledge to rewild because um, this will give you many more uh, resources, guidance, and tools that are actually free um, if you sign up for our pledge. And you'll be put on this map that shows all the people who have pledged to rewild and that can show our kind of collective impact. So I really encourage you all to um, take the pledge and, and show what, what we can do to rewild our yards. Here's some further reading. Um, I will have a, a finishing slide, but I'll leave the slide on here and then the next slide, which is also a resource slide while I'm answering questions for a few minutes. So everyone can take a picture if they want to. And I'll turn it over to you, Georgia, to start questions. on? There I am. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Anna. Wow, that was such a great presentation and what a lot of information um, you gave us. Thank you so very much. Um, and our audience has such great questions. And um, I just wanted to shout out, we have people from Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, New York, and Charleston, South Carolina. So hello, wow. everyone. I know it's kind of crazy. Um, one of the first questions we have, which you actually kind of answered is how do we get these um, lawn signs in our yard? So we just go to your website? Yes, um, they are on our website and you can find our shop page, which is on the right hand side of the site um, on the navigation bar on the, the very right. Um, and you can buy seeds or other merch. We, we sell other things too, but our yard signs are really popular. You can find our publications there too. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, here, we have a lot of leaving the leaves questions. Um, mm -hmm. This, this um, audience member, uh, she lives in a heavily wooded area. And if she puts all the leaves in her lawn into planting beds, there would be at least 12 inches. Um, <laughs> and in the last couple of years, she's chopped up the leaves, but apparently this is not such a good approach. What do you advise? Um, can it be 12 to 18 inches in the garden bed or would that kill it? 
Yeah, I think 12 to 18 inches is excessive because you would probably smother a lot of plants, maybe not every plant, but um, so I, I think that maybe the composting approach would be good for you. Um, you can find, you can designate a pile that's just for leaves. And when you compost them, it's probably a good idea, just like with um, garden scrap compost to turn it regularly. Mm -hmm. And that will help aerate it and help with the process of things break, getting broken down. Um, so I would, you know, rake, I would rake instead of blow if you can, but if you have a really large yard, I understand the need to blow, um, maybe with an electric blower if possible, um, and put those all in a pile in the fall and let those break down for maybe even a whole year. So you could add on more the, the next fall and then the next spring after that, put out, put them out onto your garden bed. Okay, mm -hmm. great, great. Thank you so much. Um, and here's another question about leaves. Um, if um, this person leaves a layer of leaves on their lawn over the winter, will it harm the grass? Over the winter, um, it still could be, it could, still could smother your grass a little bit even over the winter because many of our lawns are green even in the winter um, to some extent. Okay. So um, yeah, it's probably a good idea to, to pull them off your grass in the fall if possible. Okay. Great. Um, and here's a question about bee hotels. Um, do you recommend them? What is the best material for them? What are, what are your views on bee hotels? Yeah, so I think in one of my last slides, I mentioned that I, I don't necessarily, I don't think bee hotels are bad, especially for educational purposes for kids mm -hmm. and things like that. If you have a bee to hotel at your school, um, that's a nice way to show kids if you don't have the right habitat for native bees um, to show them kind of up close what bees require. But if possible, um, if you have a garden that you could plant a Joe pie weed or an elderberry or a flowering raspberry in one of those hollow or pithy stemmed plants, then um, you don't necessarily need a bee hotel. You'll have habitat for those native bees right there. Bees also, native bees also like to lay their eggs. Some species lay their eggs in hollow logs um, woodpecker holes, things like that. So if you can leave um, snags, which are standing dead trees, maybe not a really tall one that could fall and hurt someone, but if you have even a short, shorter one or something like that in the woods, um, that's actually gonna provide habitat for a whole host of life, including some native bees. Oh, excellent, that's, that's excellent, great. Um, here we have a question. Are there some small oaks or trees for small suburban lots that you would recommend? Definitely. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the uh, beach plum. Has anybody yes. ever heard of that one? That's a really lovely small native tree. And I think it's great as a street tree for an urban area too, because it naturally grows on the coastal plain, often out of sand dunes. So um, it, it's very salt tolerant, uh, drought tolerant, and can grow in very sandy soil and hot, tough conditions. Um, the scrub oak is another one that's a smaller tree and does um, grows in similar habitat to the beech plum. And then there's some other trees too that um, like spice bushes is considered a shrub a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but you can grow it as a tree if you prune out all the, the stems okay. and leave maybe one or th one to three stems. And if you prune it up so that the, the branches are above your, your eye height, um, then it kind of gives the feeling of a tree, a small oh. tree. So oh, you can wow. do that with a number of native shrubs actually. And beach plum is considered a shrub as well. Um, but it can be pruned as a tree. I've seen it be a really charming small tree. And do you need sandy soil for this or just kind of not for soil? every, not for every one of those trees. Um, okay. I think for beach plum, as long as the soil is well drained, okay. um, it does, as long as it doesn't hold too much water, I think it will be good for a beach plum, especially a, maybe a South side of a building. Okay. And I think for the spice bush, that's, um, that's relatively salt tolerant too, but I would say that it's a good one for the shade and for more moist, rich soils okay. if you have it, or just average garden soil would be fine for that if it has enough organic matter in it. Excellent, excellent. Um, 
Here's a question about goldenrods. Um, if you have one type of goldenrod, for example, seaside goldenrod, is it still helpful to have other types of goldenrod? Yeah, I think it, that's a really good question because um, I don't think you can ever have too many um, species in your garden. I, I kind of enrich my garden with a lot of species if possible. And maybe that doesn't mean that I have a ton of everything, but maybe I have a lot of, um, say, wild bee balm because I think that's especially beautiful um, in the midsummer and it attracts a lot of pollinators. It's kind of like a seasonal theme in my garden to have a lot of wild bee balm, but I have a lot, a lot of like singular plants here and there too that are kind of just plants that I like. So, or I, I like to have just the diversity of having many different species of goldenrods because they're, you know, genetic or sorry, um, species diversity ends up leading to biological diversity overall. So more species is better. Wow, that's a very interesting way of thinking of design too. I hadn't thought of that. Um, great answer. Thank you. Yeah, I think I learned that from um, reading um, Planting in a Post-Wild World by oh, yes. Claudia West, because she talks about those seasonal themes. Um, and, you know, there's some plants in your garden you might want to have a lot of, some plants in your garden you might want to have a smaller amount of, and it depends on the plant habit and how it acts in the landscape and what you're looking for out of it. Um, but that's a good way to think about it. You don't have to have one of everything, but, and you don't have to have only large sweeps of plants that you can yeah. kind of go somewhere in between. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, great idea. Um, this um, um, listener would like to know if you will be providing a plant list. <laughs> well, <laughs> this talk I won't, but if you look on our website, we do have, we have so many resources in general. Okay. The Pledge to Rewild actually takes you through all of those resources in a more, in a kind of step-by-step -step way. Um, through those 10 action steps to rewild your landscape. And then along the way, it, it gives you links to some of our blog posts and articles and plant lists and things like that. And But if you go to the website directly, you can um, search under learn in the navigation bar and you'll see what to plant. And that'll give you a whole bunch of plant lists, plants that are rugged native plants for planting after removing invasive species or plants for children's gardens. Um, we have a comprehensive plant list that goes over plants that work really well in different conditions. Um, and then the Native Trees for Northeast Landscapes um, tree guide, we actually have a couple lists at the end. We have one list of trees that are great as native street trees. And, and then we also have um, a plant guilds list, which we've kind of broken the, the plants down in, in that guide as looking at, you know, what plants might work together, the trees, the shrubs, the herbaceous plants that might work together in one area because they all are suited to a certain environment. So you can think of them as plant guilds. Oh, that's, that's excellent. And it kind of takes a little bit of the design problems out if, you, if they yeah. just all work together. I think um, it's best to start by looking at the conditions of your site. Your site and like the soil and the moisture and the sunlight, um, and then go from there. That's a good way to kind of, the process of elimination. Sure. Then you can go by um, season of interest, so, and height. Um, those are all nice things to kind of think about when choosing a suite of plants or a palette of plants for a particular area. Very cool. And does on this, your website, do you have a list of the nurseries that you had put up on one of your slides? Yes. Um, so if you look under that um, navigation bar tab, learn, and you'll find where to buy native plants and that will bring you to that um, page. And we list them by state. So there's still more nurseries to put up and I'm sure many of you will have some suggestions on other nurseries we could add. So we're taking suggestions um, and we might be a little slow to get them up right now just because we're quite busy, but um, eventually we want to get even more up, but we've updated it relatively recently, so it should be really good. Very good. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. This listener wants to know how much sun do meadow gardens require? Right. A true meadow garden, I think, requires full sun, which means a good um, six to eight hours a day of sun. 
Uh, four hours is is good for a lot of different types of, of meadow gardens too. You could have a part sun meadow, um, planting plants that do really well on the edge of a forest and a meadow. Um, but yeah, I think to get all the, the real full sun plants in a meadow, you'd want a four to, or sorry, six to eight hours of sunlight a day. And that should be like the middle of the day, not just the morning or not just the afternoon. Basically full sun. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, oh, we have a groundhog management idea. <laughs> so um, this um, listener um, planted a clover, clover in her lawn and used chicken fencing to keep them out. But she can't grow asters or any other kind of thing they like without them being eaten immediately. Any ideas? Oh, no. I know. I feel for you. That's a really tough one. Ground, groundhogs are not easy to get rid of in suburban areas. Um, well, I think a fence and uh, if the fence is buried underground, at least at least six inches, <laughs> oh, it would okay. get around your garden area or around you, you, you could fence in if you plant a tree or a shrub, especially um, that will protect it from voles too. Um, otherwise, during the growing season, you can also spray um, a repellent that it's non-toxic and I spray, I've sprayed it for deer as well as some small rodents or small mammals before. You get the one that's, that says for small mammals, the, um, that's important. Um, the brand that I would use is Bob X, um, like Bobcat, but Bob X or Liquid Fence. Um, and you might want to alternate between a couple brands like that also because they get used to one and then you can fake them out again with another one <laughs> but there's not really a great solution there's have a heart traps what are one of the things that you know farmers use but um we always used to joke when i worked on different organic farms we called them have no heart traps because <laughs> you still have to do something with it and um, a lot of people don't want to don't bear want to bear the idea of, of killing the animal so they'll relocate it and that's illegal in, in a lot of states to relocate an animal after you've captured it in a have a heart trap so um, that's not necessarily the best solution in my mind. Yeah, you, you, you make it somebody else's problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. This listener would like to know what you would recommend for planting on a health strip instead of lawn. Yeah, there's lots of great ideas. So there was a health strip in one of the photos with the um, native habitat sign and that has, it's a health, sh health strip in the shade. Um, and that has both Canada anemone and big leaf aster in it. And Canada anemone blooms in the spring and it's a, a pretty sturdy ground cover, I like to say. I don't always like to use the word aggressive because <laughs> it has a negative connotation, but it's a rugged ground cover, sturdy ground cover. And it's great for an enclosed space because if you put it in a small garden, um, it will kind of take over the whole garden. But if you have it in a confined space like a, a health strip, that's kind of perfect for it. And it's very tough. Um, also, big leaf aster is known, it's a woodland plant, a very common woodland plant. It's a ground cover um, and it can tolerate a higher pH levels. So I like that for urban areas that have a lot of um, concrete. And then um, I've seen prickly pear cactus um, in a really hot, sunny, dry parking lot island. I think that would be great for um, a health strip and keep the dogs from going. To <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've also seen like a really nice one with armor. Um, the Carolina Rose is a really great one for a health strip because that it's actually a you know a, a rose that grows out of um, sand dunes as well, and it's very tough and um, thick enough to kind of keep think you know keep dogs and other animals and small children out of it. <laughs> Yeah, so those That's are a, examples. Those are great, um, great answers. Um, here, here's one. Okay, um, I'm not sure I understand this, but I'll we'll try this one. I've always been told to hold oak leaves until frost hits and ground freezes, and then put them back into the garden for protection, winter protection. What are your thoughts on this? Hmm. Um, I'm not exactly sure I know what it means either, but I think um, 
maybe just, you know, to rake, maybe that person's been told to rake them off and then make sure to put them back on before the first frost. I, I'm, I think that could be it. But in any case, I think it's important to, um, if you can keep the leaves on through the fall, that'll help protect um, and keep the, the plant roots and insulated um, and the ground insulated, um, if you can keep that on through the fall. So I think the, the moral of the story with um, leaving the leaves is to leave them intact wherever you can. And then if you absolutely have to remove them, then that's okay. You can make some compromises here and there, but maybe shredding the edge of the garden bed or uh, raking them just from the lawn, but trying to reduce your lawn so that you have more space, more garden beds, more space for the leaves to go or consolidating them by composting them or shredding them. I like the idea of getting rid of more lawn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a good, um, another good reason to do so. Another good reason. Um, this listener um, wants to know she's not, they're not able to start rewilding the lawn this autumn. What is the best way for them to kick off in the spring? Yeah, um, rewilding is something that can happen um, over time. I think many people, it takes years and years, uh, you know, 10 or more years to fully rewild a property or a site. Um, so whatever stage you're at, you can start. And you could start by planning your um, what you're going to plant in different areas, maybe this um, winter. And in the spring, another thing to do is to, um, you can do some sheet mulching in the spring. So if you've planned over the winter where you're going to maybe put a few plants or start maybe a small planting bed, um, I don't want to say garden bed necessarily all the time because we're not all gardeners. Like some of us um, like the idea of planting native and rewilding, but um, we're not we don't necessarily all have it in us to become, you know, gardeners or horticulturists, but we can get started. Um, and so I think if you sheet mulch in spring and think about what you're going to buy over the course of that time for plants or start your seeds in the winter and let them germinate in spring and then grow them on for that whole growing season. Then in the fall, you can plant into that sheet mulch area. And so what sheet mulch is, is you put down um, a nice thick layer of cardboard that's overlapping. You don't want to see any sunlight. Then you cover that with um, aged wood, aged bark mulch or aged leaves. It's another thing you can do with your leaves. And um, that actually, all that organic material smothers the ground, the grass below, and also breaks down and adds more organic matter to the soil. And if you let it sit, so if you plant it in spring, or sorry, put the sheet mulch down in spring and then let it sit over the course of the growing season, so about three months or so, then it's broken down enough to plant into in the fall. And fall is a really great time to plant. Alternatively, you could also sheet mulch in the fall and then plant in the spring. Plant in the spring. Mm -hmm. Depends on how much energy you have right now. Yeah. <laughs> I, will, I could tell you it's a lot easier than digging up your lawn. Yes. <laughs> Anything's easier than that. <laughs> um, can you recommend uh, beautiful native trees or large shrubs for privacy that grow well um, near or beneath eastern pine? Yeah, I think um, pine I, is is just um, it casts a lot of shade, and it also um, the soil around pine can be a little bit more acidic. But I think most of our native plants are most of them are adapted to relatively acidic soils because a lot of New England has slightly acidic soils. Um, so I would say that a lot of different shrubs that can handle shade would do well under pine. And maybe also shrubs that are like a little bit more tolerant of drier soils too. Um, so, you know, things like rhododendron, um, there's both, uh, there's, there's, yeah, the native rhododendron maximum, that's the um, great rose bay. A mountain laurel would be another really good one to put under a pine. Um, even a spice bush, uh, I think, would do well under a pine or a viburnum that is shade tolerant. So something like a maple leaf viburnum, which is a little bit more shade tolerant than a lot of the other viburnums. Um, so yeah, those are a few good examples. And a lot of those shrubs can produce a lot of um, 
of screening. Actually, you know, another one to think about would be the um, sweet pepper bush because that oh, yes. grows in full sun, but it also grows in a fair amount of shade and, and provides a lot of screening too. Yeah, that would work really well there. Thank you. Um, this person, I, um, so there, her question is, are there varieties of native species in your seed packets different from the varieties similar similarly named natives in the southeast? Hmm. Oh, okay. So, well, they're, they're often the same species if it's the same name. So like, for instance, um, the um, maybe little blue stem grass that we sell, mm -hmm. um, even if it grows in the southeast, um, it would be the same species, but it could be a slightly different ecotype, which just means that um, maybe the, the populations that are growing within a certain region might have some slightly different traits or different genetics that we, we don't know necessarily how they're different, but just embedded in their genetics, they might have something different in there that makes them more adapted to the Northeast, say. Um, but it's the same species. So, uh, you know, if you um, if those species cross pollinated and and you got offspring from you know a plant from the southeast and from the northeast, um, then you would still have you'd still have viable offspring and it's still a plant of the same species. So it's not something I think at Wild Seed Project we don't necessarily think you only need to source um, your seed from your exact location. Like it, we don't only source seed just from Maine, but we mostly do. Um, then we do get some seed from a little bit from the Midwest and a little bit from maybe slightly farther south in the Southeast. Um, and that's because we wanna make sure that we are collecting our seed from different populations. We don't wanna have um, the same genetics year after year in the same, um, producing the same seeds that we're going to be selling to everybody. So um, we do collect from several different populations. And I think that's important for in, uh, in the way that we see um, the, the seeds that we sell. I think other organizations might have a slightly different philosophy on that, but that's how we think about it. Oh, that's very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, here's a question about ticks. Um, do these types of more natural landscapes mean even more ticks? That's a good question. I think I get that question pretty much every time. I, which I'm sure I'm, you do. <laughs> I do a talk <laughs> about rewilding. I think, I think I can understand where it comes from because yeah, you think about you know bringing in more more plants in general close to the house, more layers and more vegetation overall. You're, you potentially could have more contact with ticks because you have vegetation that's closer um, to where you're living, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily like native plantings um, that are more naturalistic are gonna breed more ticks. Um, I think it is kind of a more wider systemic problem and, you know, ticks, uh, their populations have skyrocketed and, um, it's correlated also ticks are moved around by deer and the white-footed mouse. Um, we've also seen correlation between invasive plants and ticks, things like Japanese barberry. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot to kind of consider within that big puzzle. Um, yeah. There are, you know, if we, I, I kind of think of the bigger picture is if we can have more um, healthy native landscapes, then we will have more places for um, uh, more wildlife uh, to live, as well as some of the predators that maybe eat deer or the white-footed mouse. So we'd have more um, hawks and um, coyotes and other things like that. Um, and also more um, species like possums, which actually eat ticks. <laughs> oh. um, so that's really great too. So, you know, there's a lot more to think about when you start thinking about introducing native plants. I don't think that they're going to bring in more ticks to your landscape, but 
Um, I, you know, I know people who have gotten Lyme disease by working in their garden, people who don't really take walks in the woods because they're worried about ticks. And I, I don't know, I, I think it's just, you know, do you got to do what you can to be vigilant of your exposure to ticks, no matter what. So if you are somebody who takes lots of walks in the woods, I don't think that's going to be any different from gardening with native plants. Uh, great answer. And I, I do think it is, there's so many different aspects of the tick problem. So, mm -hmm. but great answer. <laughs> um, this person, um, she has a super mature sunny meadow, 400 square feet, and she has passed through the metal, but it's also filled with mugwort. Should I remove the mugwort now and trim the non-structural plants like daisy flea blame that's flopping over um, or and then mow in the early spring? So, so the mugwort, that is something you might not realize, but that's actually an invasive species. Mm. Um, it is a very okay. beautiful, it's a nice fragrance plant. Um, and I like it for other reasons, but I don't um, want to help it help its population grow in, okay. in my landscape. So um, mugwort, I, I don't know necessarily all the latest research on re removing mugwort, but I think with that one, it's probably not quite as difficult as something like Japanese knotweed or bittersweet. <laughs> Japanese Which is another weed. question. How do you oh, remove yeah. Japanese exactly. knotweed? Yes. That has really deep roots. Um, it's, uh, you know, a chunk of the Japanese knotweed rhizome comes off and that can create more plants. Um, so it's a really, really difficult one. It comes up through concrete. <laughs> it's a tough one to, to get rid of. But I think mugwort's probably not I think it's going to be tricky if you have a meadow. I, I think it's a good idea when you're um, starting a new meadow or a new planting to make sure that you've tackled the invasive species first mm. um, before starting to plant anything new and hoping that you'll get that going and that will kind of create some competition from the invasives because you really need to uh, remove those and you can replant with rugged native plants that are going to be competitive, but only is it really going to get that competitive advantage when the invasive species is really knocked down or almost completely removed? So mugwort, I would say probably mowing before um, it goes to seed is a good idea. Maybe persistent mowing would be a good one. Maybe manual removal, making sure the roots are out. But I'm not sure of the latest, like what the best thing to do with mugwort is necessarily, but that's what I can imagine because it's an herbaceous plant and as long as you don't let it reproduce and spread, keep spreading, I think that that would, that would be what I would, uh, an educated guess about how to, how to tackle that. Um, and then for the other plants, I think, you know, if you have daisy fleabane, that's a native plant. Um, but if it's falling down into the path or something like that, that's make sure, you know, you can totally cut that back. I like to, you know, cut back anything that's unsightly that I personally um, I think, you know, it's floppy or going in, getting in the way, but then leave the majority of things up and anything that's nice and structural. Okay. Awesome. Um, so do you have any suggestions for getting rid of Japanese knotweed? <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, yeah. well, it depends, I think on, on your situation a lot of the time, but I can give you an example of, of one of our board members who has, she lives in Damascata, Maine, and she had a slope that was full of Japanese knotweed and she lives above um, the Damascata River. And it's very, very beautiful area, but um, the slope goes right down into the river and it's very steep, um, but she's very tough. And so she, she worked on digging it out for a whole year and her daughter thought she was crazy. She tied herself to a, a tree with a rope so that oh she goodness. wouldn't tumble down the hill when she was digging it out. But um, she dug a lot of it out. And then she replanted with um, a rugged native plant, flowering raspberry, which is a beautiful native that doesn't have thorns and it does have edible berries. Um, and that formed over time, she just, after she planted the flowering raspberry, she just, every time she saw some Japanese knotweed come up, she would dig it out or pull it. And um, she also seeded in some white snake root, which is a really good plant for putting into kind of like a, 
an area stream side for erosion control. Um, and so the combination of those plants, I, I got to see her house after the flowering raspberry had really taken over and there was barely any Japanese knotweed to be seen. But I think, I think the Japanese, my theory is the Japanese knotweed would probably come back if she wasn't persistently pulling it out. Wow. Um, but I think with that, with her digging as much out as possible, planting the flowering raspberry, and then she pulls the Japanese knotweed, especially in the spring before the flowering raspberry has gotten big enough. Um, I think that keeps it under control. So um, that's one thing that you can do. Digging is, you know, you're never going to get rid of all of it, even if you dig, but I think replanting with something aggressive is a good idea. Is a good um, idea. I've heard some people smothering it, but I think that's just still, I don't know if that really does it. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I can say for Japanese knotweed. I haven't had a ton of experience removing it myself, um, but um, I'd like to in the future. <laughs> that I would like to take it out. <laughs> so I'm sure I'll there's a lot back. of uh, places you could do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what types of ground covers do you suggest for the suburban environment? Oh, there's so many ground covers that can work. It depends on your light and soil conditions. So whether you have more moist soil, full sun, part sun, shade, um, dry soil, average soil. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few examples of ones that I love. Um, Pennsylvania sedge. Um, is a really nice lawn alternative. And you can see it at Garden in the Woods, um, a full kind of sedge lawn that they've created there, um, where it's mostly just Pennsylvania sedge with like a few other things kind of popping up through it. Um, and that doesn't get more than maybe eight inches at the most. And it doesn't really need to be mowed. And it doesn't need fertilizers because it can grow on kind of poor dry soils. Um, or very much water once it's established, it's pretty drought tolerant and grows in dry soils already. So it doesn't need all the inputs of a lawn, um, but it looks a lot like lawn. It's not something you'd want to, you know, play soccer on all the time, but you could walk across it every now and then. So light foot traffic. Um, wild strawberry is another really lovely ground cover um, that is has edible berries. I think the berries personally are tastier than the cultivated strawberries. Oh. Um, they're a lot sweeter. And they their flowers actually um, are important for many pollinators too. And their leaves um, are um, support moth and butterfly caterpillars, which feed on them. So um, yeah, it's a very valuable kind of lawn alternative also, or it can be kind of incorporated in a lawn. And then a third uh, ground cover, I'd say, um, is that's one of my favorites is pussy toes. Um, so there's a lot of different species of pussy toes, but I think the plantain leaf pussy toes are some of the more popular ones that you'll see for sale. And um, those are the host plant to the American lady butterfly. And they're great for kind of um, well-drained soils and full sun to part shade. And I often see them growing within lawns anyway. They can tolerate a little bit of mowing because they kind of escape the mower blades. Um, but if you can not mow them, it's great because then you'll get the beautiful fluffy um, flowers and seed heads later in the season. Great suggestions. Thank you. Um, and this, for more suggestions, this person would like to know, um, is there a native shrub that can make a good hedge around the house? Yeah, um, I think especially for a roadside, um, the um, bayberry, the northern bayberry would be great as kind of an informal hedge. Um, it grows nice and bushy, especially if you, if you cut it back, um, like cut the stems to the ground every once in a while, like every several years, then you'll get a lot of really good bushy growth. And it can even be maintained as a ground cover that way if you cut it back more often. Um, so it can, it can tolerate dry, well-drained soils, even more moist soils and full sun, I think would be ideal for it. Um, I also think that sweet pepper bush would make a really lovely hedge. Um, there are some species of native hawthorn that would make a really lovely hedge. Um, there's so many shrubs. Um, I also think inkberry holly is a nice one that's evergreen. And so that would give you some, some screening during the winter too. 
Awesome, great answers, thank you. Um, this person um, would like to know your opinion about using vinegar as a weed killer. Oh, right, so vinegar, there's um, the more horticulture grade vinegar, which is very, it actually is a little dangerous. You have to be careful when you use it because it's, it's, a, it's a very acidic um, solution. So, you know, you, I think that's okay to use especially if you have well-drained soils, then it will, it won't kind of stay in the soil for too long. Um, but you want to be mindful about where you're using anything like that, that's that strong, you know, whether there's kids or, um, pets around or, you know, if it's going to stay in the soil a while. So, you know, use it cautiously, use it with gloves and some, some eye protection, but I think an even better solution for if you have, say um, weeds growing out of your patio or something like that is you can actually boil a kettle of water and just pour it on the weeds um, relatively frequently. If you do it like once a week or something, then you'll keep on top of the weeds through the summer that way. Great idea, great idea. And then you don't have to smell like a salad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have one last question um, and actually one comment. Um, somebody had to leave with this. said, thank you very much. I'm an Anna fan. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Um, so this question is, what kind of plants do you like to plant? Oh, all the ones I've talked about. I, I um, actually, I kind of joke with, um, what, with the director of horticulture at Garden in the Woods, Uli, about um, it's hard to pick favorite plants because <laughs> And whenever we'd interview for like volunteers or interns or a new staff position, we would always ask them what their plant crush is because <laughs> um, it's a, maybe that's an easier thing to answer than what's your favorite plant. Um, you can just talk about like maybe the one that you've really grown to love that year. <laughs> but yeah, some of my go-to plants, I think asters and goldenrods are really some of my favorites because goldenrods in particular, I. I don't know. I think I'm a, a goldenrod nerd a little bit. Um, I love like silverrod is a really nice one that it's actually um, a goldenrod that has more creamy white flowers. It's the only goldenrod that's not yellow. And so that's a good one for the plant nerd. So um, what I did a garden design at, at Garden in the Woods. We installed a meadow that I got to kind of really pick out the plant list for and do a little design for. And I made sure we had several species of goldenrods added to the meadow in addition to what there already was. <laughs> so um, another great one is showy aster, which I haven't used as much in the landscape, but I'm been getting more excited about it over time because it's a ground cover and it can handle really dry soils also, um, dry kind of well-drained soils. Um, and so it's a really beautiful aster that is nice and short and also a ground cover. It, um, so, you know, anything, any ground cover or plant that grows in a really harsh condition, I usually admire and try to use in kind of analogous conditions in urban areas or um, really tough um, landscapes. Wow, great. I, I am gonna go look up that silver rod, golden rod as soon as we get off. <laughs> yeah, I think pretty. I need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's about the same height as the downy golden rod. So only like maybe three, two and a half to three feet tall at the most. So. That's doable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I think we got everybody's um, questions answered. And this was a fabulous presentation. I learned so much. Um, and um, you answered the questions brilliantly. <laughs> Very <Yeah>. impressive. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everybody, um, for joining us tonight. And um, I think that's that's it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. All righty. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, this program will be recorded and or was recorded and will be on the Cary Library YouTube page. Uh, and we'll send out a recap with a link to that and also a survey and whatnot. And thank you very much, Anna, and Georgia, and Charlie. Great. Thank you as well for inviting me. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you all.